Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. On behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the BruteCast, our series designed to connect the world to the warfighter and PME with the best and in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Nate Janikin, Operations Officer here at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who could not join us today, so we ask that you keep your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly. At the conclusion of our discussion, we will have a question and answer period, so if you have a question, just type it in the group chat and I'll go through them in the order received. So Wargaming has a long history from Chaturanga to Chess, Go in all its iterations, Kriegspiel to Free Kriegspiel and Little Wars, analog and digital versions, whether they're educational, experiential, or analytical, Wargaming has ebbed and flowed in popularity. We're currently in one of those flows, but today we're going to look back at the history of Wargaming within the Marine Corps. Uh, and I'd like to welcome back both of our guests uh, to the podcast. So Sebastian Bay is a senior game designer and research scientist at the Center for Naval Analysis, works in Wargaming, Emergent Technologies, and the Future of Warfare. He also serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the Center for Security Studies at Georgetown University. He's also the faculty advisor to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, the co-chair of the Military Operations Research Society Wargaming Community Practice, and a former fellow at the Brute Kulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare. Previously, he served six years in the Marine Corps Infantry, leaving as a sergeant, and he deployed to Iraq in 2009. And he also designed Littoral Commander Indo-Pacific, an educational war game explorer exploring future tactical warfare in the Indo-Pacific region from the Dietz Foundation. I'd also like to welcome a uh, longtime host of the broadcast, Ian Brown. He's a retired Marine CH-53 pilot and former operations officer here at the Kulak Center. Currently works as a war game analyst at Group W. He's published dozens of articles, short stories, and reviews, as well as the book, A New Concession of War, John Boyd, the U.S. Marines, and Maneuver Warfare from Marine Corps University Press, which is on the Commandant's professional reading list. Outside of work, his first original war game design, also called Maneuver Warfare, will be published next year by the Dietz Foundation. So, gentlemen, uh, welcome back to both of you. I know the conversation we're about to have is based on an article that you both uh, co-wrote uh, that came out in Jams in 2021. Uh, so with that, Ian and Sebastian, I will turn it over to both of you. All right. Thanks, Huey. Right, thanks, um, Huey. Yeah, it's good to good to be back here and sort of the other side of the chair on this thing. Yeah, so so as you mentioned, um, this talk here, it's based off an article that we co-authored a couple of years back. Um, I think that the article is the brainchild of Sebastian. And, you know, since we both can't take no for an answer to each other, um, we decided to press forward and try and, uh, you know, capture where the Marine Corps had gone before in this, um, because it seemed uh, at the time that the uh, Marine Corps was kind of on the upswing again, and a very exciting times for what was going on in terms of wargaming, especially educational wargaming across the Marine Corps. Um, you know, but we kind of knew that Marine Corps has been here before, um, and that that upswing had gone down previously. And so we wanted to kind of, you know, do a full, like a detailed assessment of the, the various sort of sine waves of wargaming in the Marine Corps, and then discuss some possible lessons for you know, how this time around, maybe, you know, wargaming, especially again, educational wargaming could actually, you know, stick inside the institution of the Marine Corps. Um, and I think um, the, since it's been a couple of years since the article came out, I think we're, we're at the point now where we can kind of maybe look at some of those lessons and we can talk about this in the Q&A and see, you know, with those couple of years, is the upswing still going? Have we, has the Marine Corps kind of made it stick? or are there you know, potential causes for concern going ahead that might have this effort be similar to the last ones? Um, yeah, so this is who we are, and there's some pictures of the games that we've been uh, designing. And I will let Sebastian take the classic uh, question here first, defining for our, our audience, what is a war game? I got the pleasure of defining a war game. So for these uh, presentation and for our article, 
we define it with the Peter Perla art of wargaming definition, which says a wargaming is a dynamic representation of conflict or competition in a synthetic environment in which people make decisions and respond to consequences of those decisions. The best way to think about it is that if the core central element of your activity, the thing that you're looking at are decisions and consequences and that interplay in some kind of artificial synthetic representation or abstraction, then it is a game by our definition. So this covers everything from command post exercises to commercial games, to digital games, and things in between. The best way that uh, we thought about this was, you know, in games at different echelons look differently. So often when people think of war games, they often think of the manual tabletop games like you know, Risk, Monopoly, you know, I mean, your traditional GMT, Avalon Hill games. But games are evolving, uh, including different mediums. But this definition is broad enough to cover enough of those, but not too broad that it goes into other areas like analysis or models and sims. Uh, and I pass it over to Ian. Okay, so to kind of begin our story here, it goes back to as many things in the military working and kind of do back to the Naval War College. Um, and, you know, so we sort of knew, like, in general, historically, the Naval War College was sort of the bow wave of wargaming in the United States military. Uh, but we wanted to dig deeper into, you know, one, to establish the proper facts of what the War College was doing and sort of how things started there at the War College. You know, but in that context, also examine, okay, where was the Marine Corps while the War College was doing all this really exciting stuff? Um, so, you know, a quick summary of how the, like how the War College got into wargaming. Uh, the college itself was founded in 1884. You had a Captain William McCarthy who ran the first quote unquote war problem in 1889 and uh, efforts sort of continually expanded from there. Uh, uh, Captain Little had produced three different types of games at different scales. One was uh, oh, just a one on one contest between individual ships. There was a fleet tactical game that pitted two fleets against each other. And then the strategic game, which captured the movements of multiple fleets across a very wide geographic area. Eventually, the duel was sort of abandoned and the War College focused more on the tactical games and the, and the strategic game. Um, so, but in that, you know, so as you see the scales of the game kind of grew and then uh, the games themselves in a physical sense also grew to put the, what you see on the picture on the left hand side of the screen there, which is, you know, the famous gridded floor of Pringle Hall in the Naval War College which became uh, you know, the, the, the center of wargaming at the school in the inner war years between World War I and World War II. And you can see in the picture, uh, you know, the floor itself is the game grid. You have uh, the black and white sticks in the foreground were used to measure gunnery and torpedo ranges. The white objects in the center are the templates for ship movement. Um, the rules for these games also extend to become more complex as well. So that to the point on the eve of World War II, the maneuver rules for the game included everything from refueling at sea to poor radios to the employment of the as yet untried in combat aircraft carrier. Um, and I've included there, I'll, I'll go into it uh, a little bit more, but the uh, the little poem in the center there is actually from a, uh, a collection that I found um, in the Sims collection at the National Archives um, from about the, the early 19 teens. But it talks about the tactical game there, you know, and somebody um, liked it so much they made a little limerick about it. Um, so, you know, we're not, not going to retread the history of uh, the Navy in the Naval War game because that's been covered pretty well elsewhere. You know, but the question that we wanted to look at is, OK, where was the Marine Corps as this was going on? Because the Marine Corps is still a naval service, obviously much smaller, you know, prior to World War II. Um, but, you know, the Marine Corps didn't really have its own, you know, robust uh, PME correct or institutions in the way that the Navy did, but especially with the Naval War College. But what we found was that the Marine Corps was sort of plugged into this stuff um, uh, kind of around the edges initially. And then as opportunity grew closer to World War II, you found more and more Marines present taking part of these games. Um, and interestingly, uh, sort of the first recorded reference of a Marine playing at the Naval College War Game comes from that same collection of limericks and uh, again, dated 1913. But it talks about, see that first line there on the, the right-hand side, a frisky Marine they call Ellis. And this, for listeners who know that, this is the, you know, the Pete Ellis who would go on to become, you know, quite famous in Marine Corps history for um, his advanced base operations in Micronesia study, which really laid a lot of the intellectual groundwork for uh, the amphibious operational doctrine that the Marine Corps would come up with or prior to World War II. So, um, and as you read the poem, it seems like Ellis was actually pretty good at what he was doing, um, you know, for a Marine at a, a Naval school. 
Um, but then following the, the 19 teens and then after World War I, we started to find more, uh, more regular documentation of future senior Marine leaders who started going to Naval War College and participating in this. Um, you know, General Commandant John A. Lejeune was a very foresighted individual. And so he kind of started this process. Um, and you'll find names like, um, you know, Colonel Thomas Holcomb, who went to the Naval War College, participated in the games 1930 to 31. Um, and then would go on to become the Commandant in 1936 and help prepare the Marine Corps for World War II. Um, so we also want to see like, okay, this like, so you have Marines present at the War College participating. Did any of this like rub off on them into their own, their own educational curricula? Um, and we kind of found a like an almost but not quite um, set of uh, set of research um, that the Marine Corps schools were doing at about the same time. You had uh, these things called advanced based problems, um, and I will pull a couple of graphics from the, the surviving documentation that's in the Marine Corps archives from those problems. And these things were done beginning 1931. They were done directly in conjunction with the Naval War College War Games. Each problem looked at the defense of the seizure of an advanced base inside a Naval theater of operations. Um, extremely high level of detail. You can see, you know, maps of landing zones. Um, and hydrography on the left there, gunfire support to the table and high detail on the right. Um, but we couldn't really call these war games in the sense that the Naval War College was doing because you know, they were really um, just very, very high level detail planning exercises. There was really no red player who was acting as the adversary uh, to, you know, to mess up these very neat tables and landing plans. You know, not to say that they weren't useful in their own right. They were continued after World War II towards the Korean War. So, you know, doing good planning processes is always useful, but we couldn't really say that, you know, this was the beginning of Marine Corps wargaming on its own because it simply um, didn't finally sort of cross that threshold to where you had an enemy on the other side. Um, that would come uh, a couple decades later after World War II, and I'll turn it over to Sebastian for that. So after World War II, there was this movement in the Marine Corps to really solidify itself as an, the amphibious force. This went along, uh, importantly, with wargaming as uh, the Marine Corps established what they called the Marine Corps Landing Force Development Center, uh, which had a long acronym called the M MCLFDC, right? This is important in 1960 because this, uh, this center essentially will later uh, evolve into the wargaming's group uh, and also the wargaming's branch. Uh, but most importantly, they were tasked with the notion of wargaming and really exploring amphibious warfare for this service. Uh, their hallmark war game was what uh, is called the Landing Force War Game, or LFWG, uh, which will be later adapted uh, and talked about more in the presentation called the Tac War series of games. Uh, but the, this game was incredibly detailed. It was double blind. It allowed players to do uh, really uh, nuance. Uh, rigid moves from weapon systems to maneuver conducting intelligence they also involved a white cell uh to allow some level of free play among the, the rigidly uh rigid adjudication of rules right think uh, your typical combat result table uh and flow tables and so forth right one of the cool elements of this game was that for example uh if you issued an order from a regiment all the way down to a, a company or a battery it would have these time delay tables in which when it will say that order would be received and executed, right? And uh, in reverse, if you ask for things uh, from higher command from a lower echelon, they would also have these elements of like, there was a time delay baked into the echelon that you'd be trying to represent command and control, which is not usually typically represented uh, really well in commercial games. So on the, on the slide, you see an example of a flow chart uh, of the educational war game, which was a predecessor of uh, or successor of the landing force war game, um, which was designed to be more simplified. But even with the flow chart, you see that there's a lot of going on is just for a simple engagement that this is how things would be happening, uh, whether there will be time delays, air defense and maintenance elements to it. Uh, this game to level to sort of convey the scale and scope of this game and its detail was to represent or replicate about 24 hours of operations in the game, right? So if you're trying to play a day's worth of operations in the game, it took roughly six months of playing uh, to do that. 
right? Um, the details was incredibly dare, uh, but also had one of his fatal weaknesses because of it, right? Uh, was that it required a really well-trained a white cell to run the game, it required players to be really versed in the rules and how the game is played, and it requires so much time and professional like edu uh, professional expertise to take part in the game. At the same time, in the 60s and 70s, there was a growing movement in the schoolhouses um, to essentially convert this you know, I mean, analytical game designed for the service uh, and to uh, tackle service problems equivalent to what we call Title 10 gaming here uh, uh, today. Uh, there was a movement in the schoolhouses from um, you know what we call EWS today, but in the amphibious schoolhouse and so forth um, to look towards how do we adapt at wargaming to be educational? How do we push it down to the schoolhouses? How do we push it down to the units? Um, and you see a lot of this in really interesting papers from us, um, the um, amphibious uh, warfare school at the time. AWS, as you see in student papers, like there was a Captain Jack Dalsman, right, who was part of the junior and senior schools. Uh, when he writes a paper of like, hey, how do we use wargaming as an instructional, like educational device, right, in teaching tactics, right? Um, there are others uh, like Lute Lieutenant Colonel Hale in the early 60s as well who writes about this stuff. And there, there are signs of how they are trying to adapt the LFWG or the landing force war game for their own purposes. And they take little rips off of it, taking pieces of the game and so forth. Uh, but there is a, a movement uh, that sort of culminates in what they call the educational war game, which is a simplified version of the landing force war game. Um, and this was designed or at least intended to be uh, uh, disseminated, uh, but it's still because of the complexity of its uh, origin, right, which is the landing force game. It really wasn't as simple as I thought it would be and wasn't simple enough to be uh, propagated throughout the service, right? So his limitations really prohibited the wide dis distribution dissemination within within the core, right? Because it required too, too high of expertise to run it, uh, too much time to run it. Uh, as anyone who has attended PME school, uh, time is the commodity that everything rub, uh, rubs up against. So in a two hour and a half course, how do you run this game, right? That takes six months, right? You have to drastically reduce uh, its complexity to get it useful. There are other uh, games that were riffed off of this uh, called Atlas At and Atlas One and Atlas Two. Um, there is a great paper by uh, a Captain Mont uh, Montenew uh, at the Amphibious Warfare School who really does a, a student field study article about it. Uh, if you're really interested, from 1965. But the great point about this is that this really leads the momentum towards how do we disseminate wargaming to the echelons and to the schoolhouses, right? And as we proceed to the next slide, sort of what we call the golden age in our paper, uh, where Ian and I will talk about different efforts that came into, into fruition, which you'll see here on the two left hand, uh, hand side photos is TAC war. Um, and I'll briefly talk about that before we proceed to the uh, Ian's portion, which is TAC war was really a culmination of two forces. One, this internal force inside the Marine Corps to really adapt the educational war game and the landing force war game into something useful for the wider service. At the same time, uh, in the 1970s uh, and uh, sort of early 80s was like sort of the peak point uh, of commercial war gaming. So for those who were born after uh, the 1970s, uh, Simulations Publication Incorporated, also known as SPI, Avalon Hill, like these commercial entities really came into the forefront of like commercial board gaming. Um, I think there's a great statistic at one point in like in the 1970s, SPI owned like 50% of all published board games or uh, commercial war games. It's pretty intense. Um, but at the same time, you see this blending happening uh, to produce the TAC War family of games. So the TAC War family of games is really four games sort of seated within each other. Uh, they're referred to as the TAC War family. But the first level is the company level game, looking at company engagements uh, called TAC War. Steel Thrust, which is the battalion or MU level staff war game. Landing Force, which is sort of the regimental and MEB level uh, staff game, and Warfare, which is sort of the MEF MEB level uh, of staff work and sort of uh, considering operational warfighting. So those are the four games designed for it. So think about it as instead of taking this approach that the educational war game had of like this one game will fit all needs for all echelons, all units, and all purposes, um, this one sort of purposely broke them out into four different uh, bins, right? It's like, hey, uh, if you're a company commander, your decision 
decision space and what you can do and what you're trying to teach is fundamentally different if you're sitting at the MEF staff, right, in Okinawa or in Pendleton or Lejeune. So they broke this up into the four games and they actually disseminated in the early 1980s um, uh, a copy of these games to the rifle companies, right? To have at least a copy of TAC War at all uh, the rifle companies. This is representative of what the Prussians did where Crickspiel, when they first disseminated Crickspiel, of like pushing it down into the line units. Um, and it was really an important element of it and it sort of uh, drove other uh, wargaming efforts that came after it, which I will pass over to Ian to touch. Yeah, so as Sebastian said, we're, we're in the golden age with this very, uh, very fortuitous fusion of like the commercial and the grassroots efforts inside the Marine Corps. Um, so outside of the TAC war, you know, they were also um you know other other things started percolating in terms of how wargaming was being used in the marine corps you know in the 1980s and then going into the 90s is when you started seeing greater proliferation and accessibility of electronic computers right you know i know this may be shocking to some parts of the younger audience but there was a time when not everybody had a personal computer sitting at their desk um and the computers that did exist were uh, some of them were quite expensive and only restrict you know able to be bought by large businesses or the government but as as you know, computer right, computer power sort of became more democratized and accessible. Um, all the services, to include the Marine Corps, started looking at how they could use it for wargaming. Um, you had uh, one of the first uh, computer type games the Marine Corps used was an adaptation, actually, of a Navy um, a fire control computer software called the Tactical Warfare Simulation Evaluation and Analysis System. And uh, Marine Corps kind of ported that over, adapted it for its own use to the Marine Air Ground Task Force Tactical Warfare Simulation, or MTWAS, um, which many uh, those in the, the Marine Corps still today and in recent years have probably heard of, heard about it. Um, and then you also had some interesting things like uh, adapting, uh, you know, very uh, very commercially oriented computer games like the the first person shooter Doom for Marine Corps use. Um, you see in the top right hand corner there, that's a screenshot from a, a essentially mod of Doom 2 that was authorized under General Charles Krulak when he was Commandant in the late 90s um, that, that basically reskinned the game with Marine Corps um, graphics, weapon systems. You can see that's an M2, that's a saw squad automatic weapon right there getting fired, um, Marine Corps equipment. So that, you know, in using these new digital um, and more widely proliferated personal computing tools, you could you could play a, like a digital force on force game um, with a computer running all of the adjudication in the background and, and really get into that higher fast tempo, you know, of small unit tactics, small unit firefight type things. Um, but it wasn't all computers either. Uh, we also found some really interesting stories of ad adapting, as Sebastian said, that proliferation of commercial tabletop games. Um, there one story we found was on the operation or the eve of Operation Desert Storm. You know, early 90s, you had infantry Marines who were using the venerable tabletop game Advanced Squad Leader, which uh, lower right hand corner, there's a picture of, of what that looks like, uh, to rehearse seizing and breaching Iraqi defensive positions. Um, they used Advanced Squad Leader to develop uh, some leapfrogging tactics that would allow them to assault the fortified positions using mortars, smoke, and heavy weapons, you know, to get that combined arms effect and then breach through the trenches eliminate the defenders, uh, you know, with minimal, you know, loss of life um, or equipment on the Marine Corps side. And you even had, you know, um, going back to General Krulak, he he wrote, you know, one of the, the things we that sort of hasn't been present in this narrative so far is like that top down um, thou shalt support um, and directive given to Marines and the commanders in charge of them to do certain things that the institution wants to do across the board. General Krulak did that. He uh, issued an order, Marine Corps Order 1500.55, called Military Thinking and Decision-Making Exercises, um, which basically said that, go forth and do this. This is useful. This is this is a good training tool. And hey, oh, you can do everything from, you know, doing the tabletop games and TAC War to installing commercial games on your government computer, you know, which is a mind-blowing thing to those of us on, or have, you know, used the uh, military networks, you know. There was a time when you could put Doom on your military computer because the Commandant said not only was it okay, but he ordered you to do it. Um, but as we get to the end of the 90s, uh, unfortunately, kind of in some past efforts, uh, Mission Creep started to uh, 
enmesh itself in uh, you know, the, the efforts that were going on across the Marine Corps. We, we came across some articles in the Gazette talking about TAC war where, you know, it had been expanded and upgraded more and more to make it, quote unquote, more realistic, which ultimately made the game more complicated, made it longer to play um, and increased the physical area needed to actually play the game. You know, you take a look at that picture in the bottom left there. That's only a snapshot of the table that's covered. So you can imagine that there you probably needed a lot of table space and room space to play the full version of that game. And eventually TAC war became so bloated that you had a Marine writing in the late 90s that, quote, um, the game was neglected at all levels. It was stacked like cordwood in warehouses, bogged down in its own procedures, so muddled with administrative minutia that players soon became bored and their initial enthusiasm was lost. Um, and that mission creep, um, unfortunately, also seem to mesh in, um, you know, with the, the U.S. military and the Marine Corps' attention to the global war on terror, um, and it seemed to accelerate as the GWAT picked up, which we, we couldn't find sort of like, you know, a, a single cause for why this was. It was just ironic and kind of unfortunate when you had, you know, a, an actual military campaign kicking off the wargaming tool that had long been sought after to prepare Marines for war was sort of set on the shelf um, because, you know, what well, we got to focus on, you know, we got to focus on real things now for the uh, the war and the, the the mental training, the staff procedural training, the ability to, to think against a, another, a red adversary in a war game. Again, ironic, but it seemed it, that capacity seemed less important than going through, you know, pre-deployment training lanes. Um, and, and it is unfortunate in some ways because right as the GWAT was kicking off was when some really, uh, Marine Corps specific tools uh, were becoming available. You had uh, in the lower left or lower, sorry, lower right hand corner there, there was an effort by uh, Marine Corps Training Education Command to take advantage of that use of personal computers, commercial games, and uh, they supported developing a Marine Corps version of a close combat tactical computer game with all Marine Corps stuff. It was called Close Combat Marine. Uh, development was as assisted by a major Brendan McBreen. Who, uh, who has written extensively on use of wargaming and other PME things for the Marine Corps. Um, the Close Combat Marine was integrated into uh, staff NCO courses at the Marine Corps Institute, um, but it came out in 2004, right? And it, as we looked at sort of 2002, five and six, um, more and more focus came on, you know, sort of trying to staunch the bleeding for what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, falling into the surge. And you had, uh, unfortunately, the close combat Marine really never got extensive use um, in the way that it was intended. Um, and there were a handful of other tools that came out there. Um, you know, Marine Corps, the Title 10 war games that Sebastian mentioned earlier, uh, Marine Corps had one called Expeditionary Warrior. Uh, you know, but these games are inherently limited into the audience that they, that are invited and that the results are reached. You know, these are usually closed door, much higher level decision makers and, and classified at levels that nobody can, nobody else outside the room can really kind of access the information that kind of came out of it. Um, and there were efforts to use other commercial games too. Like there's a screenshot there in the top left of the Operational Art of War, which is a, uh, it's an older, but it's a very useful game because it's a very powerful mission editor. Um, but again, you know, the early, early 2000s, everybody's got a computer now, um, but the, the usage of, these things for wargaming, especially digital wargaming, uh, really declined um, quite rapidly. And then there was almost a lull period from roughly uh, uh, 2005 to 2015, where you know there was very little uh, evidence of wargaming being used across the institution. There were some islands of excellence. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, some efforts at Marine Corps University using decision forcing cases, um, and you know maybe one or two places across the fleet, but. Really, that was, that was limited to the effort of a in certain individual who was motivated and just wanted to do it. There was no greater institutional, um, you know, sort of drive to use this tool across training and education, uh, you know, for a large number of Marines who, who again, you know, the, the rationale was more, more Marines benefiting from this will be better for the Marine Corps. Uh, but that, that didn't really happen. Um, until somewhat recently, we're back on the upswing, and I'll turn it back to Sebastian for uh, our renaissance. So one of the things I would like to say up front is to say 
this upswing in Marine Corps Wargaming, both educational and analytical, although our, we f sort of focus on the educational side, is the culmination of like various individuals and various organizations. Uh, for instance, like Dr. James Lacey or Jim Lacey at uh, McWar, right? The Marine Corps War College has been doing Wargaming for his curriculum for a long time. He has some great War on the Rocks articles um, that you know, didn't go away as much as they sort of gained more traction uh, as you know, we approached 2015 and then forward. You know I mean, he used Passive Glory. He loves Polis and other games uh, uh, and Next War as part of his uh, curriculum, right? And uh, Dr. Ben Jensen, um, who uh, who was part of the School of Advanced War uh, Warfighting, also used games like Command and other games to sort of represent an experiment with educational wargaming and AI and wargaming uh, really early on. And was one of the progenitors of like uh, the Marine Corps Fight Club, all right? which was associated with TCOM and sort of the wider schoolhouses here uh, at Quantico, right? Um, and this is to say that there are lots of hands involved um, and they sort of uh, reached this crescendo of wave-like uh, renaissance here. And you know, we have Tim Barrick who also did similar things. We'll talk more about OWS later, but that was part of that uh, renaissance as well was as the schoolhouses adopted more and more wargaming within the curriculum themselves as to expose more um, officers and enlisted to wargaming. It became more and more part of that wider culture. I mean, MCU has been a big hub of that, right? Through the Krulak Center and its curriculum and sort of like wargaming master plan of how to do more wargaming to part of PME. Like one of the reasons um, I, I always joke with uh, Ian when he was back at the Krulak Center in uniform was like one of the reasons they chose me as a Krulak fellow was to do wargaming. And I remember the first you know two years of my uh, like non-resident fellowship at MCU at part of the Krulak Center was a supporting fact devs and running war games and supporting uh, a war gaming course uh, at command staff college right was all part of that effort and it was really uh, a large effort across the entire service and you see more and more of it popping up uh currently down even at the tactical level and um, of course, I will show like uh, this was in the early days of uh, littoral commander Indo Pacific, the game I designed uh, when it was still called Fleet Marine Force or FMF. And you see the photo at the very bottom center, where you see a bunch of captains and Marine Corps captains, and um, you know what I mean playing the early version of the game as we ran 16 versions of this game at EWS for all the, the cohorts there. And I was in conjunction with the Krulak Center and so forth to not only play test the game, but to really see and sort of provide a utility proposition of like, this is what war games can provide for you, right? And sort of revitalize that sort of notion of experiential learning um, throughout their service. Uh, and Ian, your turn. Yeah, um, and I guess the only one big thing I'll I'll add there too is you know kind of getting back to that that top down um, support and motivation you know for why this this renaissance kind of bloomed is you know um, sometimes as with either uh, you know adopting the maneuver warfare doctrine of the Marine Corps in the eighties and the early nineties or with General Kulak's effort in the late nineties for computer gaming um, you can have lots of motivated people lots of energy but it, it can often um, not not really go anywhere unless the person at the top says you shall do this and all you know you shall do this and all my deputy commandants are going to do the things in your various wheelhouse to make this happen and that's really what happened with um, when General Berger took over in 2019 as the commandant um, his commandant's planning guidance and then you know kind of the bow wave of the the force design 2030 effort that came after it you know but it, his planning guidance made it clear man things were going to change um, big changes coming. In a lot of different ways, um, but what was interesting when uh, when I was at the Krulak Center and we first started like going through it with the red band to see which parts applied, you know, to the professional military education, it came clear very quickly that he put a tremendous value um, on the the use of wargaming. Thought it could be valuable across multiple um, areas to include education. It's all over the Commandant's planning guidance. Um, you know, and so that was sort of the finally the top down, go forth and do this, thou shalt um, support that it needed to, to really finally take the really great effort of a lot of these individuals and um, and give it some backing, you know, to really drive it home in the places that it needed to be driven home to to stick as a institutional tool. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so you know the the, the master plan Sebastian talked about, like you know if that came with resources, that came with um, efforts to to apply those resources among other things to you know hire Tim Barrick as war gaming director to start building you know the first of its kind digital war gaming cloud to be used across the Marine Corps, you know to to allow Marines wherever they were now to get access to some of these games, um, you know, using the, you know, now, now you don't even need a personal computer. you got a, a cloud thing you can access with almost any device, you know, that's, that lets the reach of wargaming and lowering the, the barrier to entry in terms of resources to do it. That makes it much more powerful. And that stuff doesn't happen if you don't get somebody at the top, you know, finally saying, do this, here are the resources, but I'm also, here's my order to go do it. Um, and that, and uh, so I think that kind of carries us through here um, to, to to present day, which I guess we can talk about. But uh, the last thing we did in our piece was talk about some of the lessons that we had sort of gleaned from the study of history to help inform and hopefully, uh, you know, give some framework to the folks doing things in the Marine Corps to actually, you know, to really drive it home and make it stick this time. Uh, so Sebastian, I'll let you uh, start running through some of these here. So as a game designer, um, I always think about what is the balance you always have to think about fidelity and playability and this compromise, wherever that point is uh, for you and your your specific game or your curriculum or your unit will depend on your perspectives and your purposes, right? This is why bespoke games, ga games built for purpose are still very much uh, the norm in DoD. But one of the key lessons we took was like all games will make compromises and abstractions and where that balance point is, the point where you're willing to say, I want more granularity and make it complex and the rules will be more complicated, or I want it to be more simplified and simple and accessible uh, and playable versus giving up to think about every single detail, right? Uh, this lesson is true for all the various games we've talked about from the very first game, the Land and Force War game, to the educational war game, um, to TAC War, even towards the end of TAC War became increasingly uh, more granular and um, sort of difficult to play as um, it tried to add more and more things to a system that was really designed to do sort of company level combat. And you'll see this later on, even through my own littoral commander system, like people always ask like, why didn't you put this? Or why didn't you put X or Y? Or uh, why did you make these choices? And often it was like, I, because I emphasize for my own game playability and accessibility over getting every single detail inside the game. Um, and that choice, that balance will be different for different echelons. And that's something we sort of leads to the second point, which I will lead is use a family of games then rather than one game rule uh, to rule them all is different echelons will have different needs. Uh, Air Squadron in Okinawa will have very different uh, perspectives of, let's say, an uh, intelligence uh, battalion looking for war gaming, right? They will look for different games and there is no game that will satisfy them all, right? Uh, and it is a fool's errand to do so, right? Um, and it's really about how do you create a family of games, an ecosystem of games that layer upon each other, uh, that complement each other, that feed into each other, work well together, um, or work for specific purposes that one game uh, misses, um, so you can build a, a comprehensive system of gamings. Uh, for instance, we've talked about OWS, which is designed by Tim Barrett, and uh, is a fantastic game looking at the operational art of war, right? I think it is great for that. It's fantastic for sort of representing that sort of um, GIF-MIC, gif you know, JFAC level of staff considering of how do I do true multi-domain operations across a theater, right? It's a great game for that. Um, I joke that Littoral Commander is like one hex in his game, right? <laughs> uh, where like my entire map is like one hex in his game, uh, one of his map, uh, one of his original Assassin's Mace maps. Uh, that is to say that we just have different things we're looking at, right? Which is Littoral Commander was designed for like the company and battalion level, uh, you know what I mean? Was lo really looking at captains and majors and their uh, enlisted lead NCOs, right? was like, how do I do like platoon, company, battalion level ask like EABO stand and force uh, tactics, right? While, you know what I mean, OWS is like looking at the entire theater. So hopefully in the future, right, is the, the notion that we're working towards like uh, staff sergeants and captains and lieutenants will get their first taste through Lutol commander, get that uh, echelon, uh, the tactics at their echelon. But then when they come to MCU um, for Command Staff College or McWard, they will see OWS uh, as they go towards their 
transition to staff uh, officers and staff positions, right? Um, and their perspective will change, right? And the needs of their games will have to change. So that is the notion of like, there has to be a family of games, everything from little micro games to big games like OWS and Total Commander and even digital games. It's not to say it's only just manual games. Um, Ian, I'll let you touch the last three. Okay, so yeah, so lesson three um, was you know, there a thread through the the history of it was there were lots of great sort of individual efforts that really blossomed where they were, uh, but sometimes they sort of died on the vine because they were, they had sort of had no way to find each other or and provide mutual, you know, support whether that was sharing expertise or resources or some combination thereof. So, you know, connecting those um, those different groups to each other is really really important because kind of like there's no one game to rule them all. There's like there's no one you know, organization or military unit um, or individual that knows everything about everything about wargaming. There's lots of people with different areas of expertise, different game types, you know, organizations looking at different different problems using games to solve them. Um, so, you know, connecting them to each other is a, it makes it, it, you know, it's the rising tide that raises all boats, um, but it really, it can help those individual efforts um, sustain themselves by making themselves better um, and as well as, you know, being able to pull in other people or resources or, or knowledge that aren't resident there. Um, I think the, you know, we live in the digital age now, right? Um, kind of the golden age of the Marine Corps Wargaming was back, you know, going into the late 90s, where the internet was kind of becoming a thing, um, you know, but was still um, not nearly as proliferated as today, right? Like, maybe you had a personal computer back then, um, in your home and maybe you knew you shared email, you know, a couple of times a day, whereas now, like, I'm just staring at my desk in my office. I have three computing devices and, you know, all kinds of messaging, email and social media applications to share stuff. So uh, I think it, like it's easier than ever to really connect those islands. So, but, you know, you, you have to go out and make that effort. Um, but if you do, you can find the others who are out there um, to help each other out. All right. The resourcing. Um, this, I, I guess, I, I, it may be a soapbox for Sebastian, but I think it's also one for me, which was, um, you know, the the notion that in sort of, you know, a classic DOD approach to a problem solving is, you know, we'll throw lots of money at it and something will happen in the midst of that. Um, that is that is not necessarily the case here to to do good wargaming. Um, more money can make you do better things, right? Which is why there's a Wargaming Center being built uh, aboard Quantico right now, you know? And it's also why um, Marine Corps University has been developing the, the cloud-based Wargame um, ecosystem, right? You can't you can't do that on, on the cheap. Um, that, that does take resourcing to do something at that level, um, you know? But for the individual, you know, unit or the, you know, the platoon or, you know, a couple of Marines or, um, you know, some folks who are doing the distance education out there, just to get started, it does not take millions, right? There's uh, it, the games themselves these days, you know, if you, you buy a brand new copy of a standard board game off the shelf, it's maybe 60 or $70, um, you know, and roughly the same for a computer gaming title. Um, some of that stuff can be cheaper uh, if you buy it used and there, there are a large number of entities that will sell you used board games, you know, for, you know, deep discounts. Um, you can also find some discontinued titles there. You know, if you want to go back and um, find one of those classic SPI games because you think it might be useful, there's probably a place out there that'll sell it to you. Um, you know, but it just, it, you don't know, like re resourcing should not be the reason you're not doing it because um, with a little bit of homework, you can find good, useful war games for education and training um, for pennies on a dollar. Um, it, it does not take a lot. And going back to that, connecting the islands of excellence, if you don't know where to start or, or a cheap option, just ask. Um, you, you can find answers. And then last point there is leveraging the Marine. And, uh, you know, it's probably, you know, a bumper sticker every Marine has heard in their point is like, yeah, you know, get, get the Marines to fall, you know, give me a couple of good lands corporals and we'll solve all the problems in the world. Um, well, that's true here as well, right? Like we, we talk about how we're the, you know, Marine Corps is very high standards. You know, we're recruiting the best of America. We have lots of talented individuals. Um, well, use it. Um, you use it to help build something uh, where you're at if you don't really know where to start. 
go ask your Marines, like if they're playing games, I'll, I'll save you the like spoiler alert again, right? They are. You've already got Marines, like, you know, who, whether it's playing Fortnite in the barracks or, um, you know, playing Magic the Gathering or some sort of, you know, just using regular poker cards in the well duck of a ship waiting to go off and do something on a Mew. Marines are already playing games. And, and uh, if you ask them to run something for you, I'm fairly certain the answer would not be, well, nobody here will do it. You'll have to probably fight off the number of people who'll be willing to share, you know, that aspect of their life and that passion to go do it. Um, and again, circling back to collaboration, you know, junior Marines are already playing games, but they're still around. A lot of those folks who were there in the Marine Corps in that golden age period, hey, they're still here, right? And because now we're in the digital age, they're not hard to find. Um, so you can still find, you know, Peter Perla is uh, still out there and he's still going to wargaming conferences and things like that. He's still sharing that information. Eric Walters, uh, you know, when he was a young captain, fired up writing stuff in the Gazette in the 90s about doing wargaming. He's, he's still out there doing wargaming and, uh, you know, fairly, fairly extensive list of other folks who, who can be leveraged and are more than willing to do it um, if one simply asks. Okay, um, great. I think that takes us to the end here. So, uh, Sebastian, if you want to add anything else here, um, otherwise we're ready to start taking questions. So, the one thing I will say to Ian's last point is um, about leveraging the Marine is like, I think one of the things to really push wargaming, educational wargaming into the tactical echelon is to really leverage the enlisted force, right? Like staff NCOs. Um, and this conviction has been reaffirmed as I've been talking and discussing with like a bunch of gunnies and staff sergeants who are now leading their own wargaming initiatives at their own echelons uh, after going through CME. Um, and I think that is like untapped, like, you know what I mean, talent that we don't use well enough or enough of like understanding the officers at different echelons at the major and captain level are like already tapped out to their eyeballs right with things they already have to do and throwing war gaming on top of it at their at their echelon has a lot to add um so i think there is i think we just need to open our aperture a little bit more yeah thanks guys i i think the one thing that i would like to add and i, I think it kind of goes into like you know this conversation about war gaming and where it is in the marine corps and and just generally in the dod really there needs to be like a, a higher up person, you know, Ian, you mentioned General Berger, but really that that push started with General Neller as well. You know, we have the the Neller Center, which is going to open up next year for for war gaming. And, you know, General Neller got the ball rolling, but General Berger really started kicking it down the street to make sure that it really started getting going a lot faster. And I think, you know, in the opposite end of that, you know, General Sherman in a in a present or a speech at West Point, I think for a graduation, you know, he made the comment, uh, I know there exist many good men who honestly believe that one may, by the aid of modern science, sit in comfort and ease in his office chair and with little blocks of wood to represent men or even with algebraic symbols, master the great game of war. I think this is an insidious and most dangerous mistake. You must understand men without which your past knowledge were vain. Uh, and there was actually a massive dip in wargaming uh, for the U.S. Army after he made those comments. So, you know, having somebody at the top kind of push those, uh, I think, is is pretty critical. Uh, one of the first questions we got was from uh, Adil, and he asked about the the software linking software with tabletop. So, linking the analog and digital. What do you guys think about uh, that and and our current state of wargaming in the Marine Corps? Um, so I'll, I, I think Sebastian can probably talk more extensively about this. Um, well, I think there, like there, there's some gain, like if there's opportunities to do that, that's obviously useful because, uh, you know, one of the sort of the challenges of establishing a, a good continuum, you know, continuum of war games or repeated touch points across somebody's career is it's harder if you got to learn a new game every single time. Right. Whereas, you know, um, if we take, Take Littoral Commander or OWS, for example, both of which have digitized versions of them. You know, we, you can play that game in the, the context of Marine Corps University going through a PME class, but then you could go back to your unit and still do it digitally um, and not have to learn an entirely new game to sort of, you know, keep yourself um, up to speed as well as 
you know, share that with the, you know, share the learning you had at resident school with folks once you get back to your unit. Um, so that, so I think that certainly helps. Um, on the flip side though, I think there are, um, each has its place and um, among the value of doing tabletop stuff is, uh, and, and this, this is, will seem sort of like simplistic, but it doesn't make it untrue. Like with a lot of table table talk games, you just need a table, right? You don't need a computer. You don't need a network. You don't need the various, uh, you know, network security requirements that might go on with using uh, certain types of software, and whether it's on a government network or a government machine. Um, you don't. You you just need a flat surface and a light source, and you can still do effective wargaming if the digital option is not uh, available there. Um, but I'll let Sebastian go on uh, in more detail. So I think. Um, often we think of games often in binaries like manual or digital, um, but I think there's a really interesting space uh, that the commercial field is sort of leading on of like this blending of uh, manual and commercial uh, or manual and digital games. Like there's a great Lord of the Rings, uh, Fellowship of the Ring game that has like a, a software element to it where like there's an app. Uh, there's a great tactical game called Air Skamoosh, which has also an app element to a manual sort of game. Um, and I think it, it provides interesting elements of like, hey, can I do more things with a game manually that still have the social element, that have the tactile element, but maybe potentially offload some of the the, the tedious things or uh, increase detail by having calculations done by app, right? That keep tracks. Like for example, uh, for Lutoral Commander, right? Could you have an app that keep tracks of all your ammo supply? You're sort of tapping things versus having a bunch of unit trackers on the map that takes up a lot of space, right? Uh, we tried to do this with Excel originally uh, under its FMF um, version and prototype, right? Uh, same thing. You, I think you could do similar things with games like Scythe, right? That have a lot of like sort of number crunching towards the end to calculate calculate uh, like victories, right? Um, or like, you, is there some other elements that where you can incorporate those kind of things? I think there are fantastic ways to do that. Um, and I think there's idea to be noodled on about how do we use this sort of benefit of apps and also like mobile games and all this computer power that we have in our pockets uh, and also apply them while still retaining some of the real core elements of manual games, which is like getting people at a table, that conversation, that social element, while potentially increasing granularity by sort of uh, pushing that off to, you know what I mean? app that whether that's AI enabled or whatever, right? I think that's a really interesting thing. And I think uh, a lot of us are sort of experimenting with it. But um, the hard part right now is like the current generation of war game designers and app developers are like two different circles that don't have lots of Venn diagram overlap, right? Like a lot of things like, oh, I would love to do this. I have these ideas for apps. And then people are like, do you know how to code? I'm like, absolutely not, right? Uh, so I think we sort of need to get these sort of circles into more Venn diagram, but I think that's a work in progress. Yeah, and um, Sebastian mentioned something um, I, that kind of ties back to Kiwi. Your comment about that Army General too is there. Like, I, I'm I'm a I'm an equal opportunity war gamer. Like, I think there's value and advantages to digital and tabletop in their own realms. But you know, as Sebastian said that that gathering the people around the table, that social dynamic, um, to respectfully disagree with the general's comment that you're simply pushing pieces of wood and there's no human element. Um, I sort of wonder if that general was present in a room where you had a very active tabletop game going um, because you absolutely get a human dynamic and a human side to it. You know, it's not the pieces themselves that are a human element, but the people who are around the table, uh, man, you, and you can have that roller coaster of emotions um, and you can actually learn some really interesting things about the people on your team or on your staff in terms of how they react under on a tabletop game to things like incomplete information, to time constraints, to uh, to suddenly taking catastrophic losses, even though they're fake cardboard wooden pieces, what have you, you know, how do they react to the sudden loss of a key critical asset? Um, there's a tremendous human element in there too, and, and getting a better understanding of the people on your team. Um, you know, you can get an understanding of who's really good under pressure, who's really good in a time crunch, or who just like, reverts to being a sulky teenager when things aren't going their way and they just unplug and don't want to participate. Um, that's a good thing to know, right, in your military staff, especially uh, before those people are put under actual pressure. Um, in fact, there was a, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I think I, I might have told you, and I know I told Sebastian about this, but 
I was up in DC at a, a university, which I won't name particularly, but I went to do a kind of a matrix style war game, looking at a future crisis um, in the North, uh, kind of around the Baltic area. Um, and just, uh, just people watching how the individuals on those different teams interacted. Um, you, you really got a good sense of, you know, one people were sort of, they went into the liminal circle for that game, but you saw how people could start losing their, losing their stuff in a made up game environment under, you know, nobody's dying. There's no threat of actual nuclear war, but inside the game, some people were really good at managing their staffs and handling the pressure. Some people, other people I saw, there were almost like some fist fights and yelling matches going on because people didn't like what another person on their team was doing, what have you. There's a fascinating human dynamic by putting people in around the table. Um, whether or not the blocks themselves have humans in there, there's still humans involved. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing I would add too is, is you can do an interesting combination, kind of, you know, Sebastian's comment about you, there's not one game to rule them all. Like, you know, there's not a, there's not an evil, evil game to, to, to be at the top of all evil games, uh, but you can mix the two. So, you know, a couple months ago with uh, Saw, we did an exercise where they planned out, uh, they had a planning problem. Uh, their one of the plans got plugged into Command Professional Edition, and prior to them coming to the tabletop, all the students got to see that plan run out over several iterations within Command uh, Professional Edition, so they could kind of see the results of what happened, so they could see engagements, you know, at a much closer, nuanced level that Command Professional Edition could provide you. But then they came to the table and used OWS, which, you know, at its core does not get, you know, down to the nitinoid detail about, you know, a missile going against a defensive missile like Command PE does. But they got to see a different element of their plan because that Command PE only played out like two or three days worth of conflict, whereas the what we played out on the tabletop was four iterations of 15 day periods. So they got to see 60 days worth of their plan played out on the tabletop. So you see different elements to it. We're getting close to the end of our hour. Uh, so I do want to uh, have at least this one question that comes from uh, uh, our Wargaming Director, Mr. Barrick, who asks about uh, what are your thoughts on establishing a set of games that Marines are expected to play at each rank? So taking that idea of the Commandant's reading list uh, and turning it into a Commandant's Wargaming list. I think we should have one, but I bet Sebastian has some uh, some detailed thoughts on that uh i think we do need um a game at different echelons i really think that is a, a move towards making educational wargaming be part of the gene the, of pme in the service and part of the marine corps culture um there should be a game sort of like revitalizing the notion of t the tac war family of games that there should be a game that when you walk into EWS and you walk out, that all of you share an understanding that y'all went through this one game, right? And that game should always sort of be um, based on like uh, the most recent sort of guidance. Right? So you should always be willing to change what that game is, right? Like, so it should not always be the same game, right? So like, for example, um, see me being used at, uh, uh, see me using the troll commander right now is relevant because of the NDS and the, and the our service priorities, but maybe 25 year, uh, years from now, it, littoral commander needs to be replaced by something else, right? Uh, depending on the tech, on what, what we want to teach our NCOs, but I do think that there should be a slot at like AWS, uh, command staff college, McWar, um, or, and especially even on the Linsa side, I see me and other schoolhouses alike, there should be some game. Maybe it's not a big game, maybe it's a small game and so forth, but I think there should be part of that sort of 21st century model of learning of beyond just lectures and discussions and also like experiential learning. Um, my one soapbox issue with this is that we tend to have a, and you know, I'm guilty of this because I literally design, most of my like professional work is in like tactical and operational war fighting, um, is that we tend to focus on like the combat arms, right? For war gaming, right? Like air combat, infantry combat, like high Mars and artillery, like things that go boom. Right. Um, and I am taking, even as myself, as a personal designer is like designing games for like all the 
uh, tail that goes with the uh, with the tooth, right? Portion of the military structure, right? Like not building games only for infantry battalions and infantry uh, high Mars battalions, right? Like, um, like I, you're an Ian knows because I sent it to him and I, and I sent it to Kiwi too. Is like my air sortie game of like, hey, like. I don't want to create an air combat game where it's about fighters on fighters, where that is the focus. I want to create a game for like maintainers and for maintainers to teach like infantry guys that like just because I have 10 aircraft helicopters or hornets or whatever on my order of battle does not mean you get 10 hornets every day. Right. Um, and to sort of teach that air sortie generation and maintenance and all that important thing. Um, and Kiwi and I had uh, a great conversation on Twitter about it as he was giving me feedback about the game of how it could be adjusted and adapted. Uh, and so forth. And I think that's the part, right? It's like we need to open the aperture to be like, hey, how do we convey uh, everything from uh, civil affairs marines to building games for bilateral co collaboration with our partners as we think allies and partners are really important how do we get, build games for teaching about isr intelligence gathering um you know I mean things that are beyond just like things that go boom and like that get a lot of the intention now i think that will be the next step yeah, that was a great conversation on Twitter uh, about all those those different elements. Because you know, my last job at the MAGTAF staff training program as an aviation SME, I spent a lot of time trying to explain to people: yes, just because you have ten Ospreys in that squadron does not mean you get ten squad ten Ospreys worth of stuff. And trying to explain the concept of two to make one, three to make two, you know, stuff that Ian's shaking his head and completely understands. You know, it is completely foreign to somebody who hasn't spent any time with the wing. Um, so we are definitely at our hour. I do want to, however, give both of you an opportunity to give some closing comments if you have any. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Ian first. Sure. I, I guess the thing I'll say is, and it kind of goes to to Colonel Barrick's question. Um, you know, I would love to have a, a comment on wargaming list, and, and it's great to see. The effort going on around the Marine Corps, and I am—I have some cautious optimism that maybe it, it will stick this time, you know. But to the thing of the the war, the Commandant's wargaming list, and you know, with the professional reading list, the thing that still needs to change inside the institution is developing the the framework for making it matter, uh, making it matter in a sense of you know, to whether it's the individual Marines annual fitness report evaluation or it's their performance at PME. Um, if we really want people, you know, if we really want to institutionalize it and embrace it, um, it needs to be embedded into the, you know, it needs to take root into the, um, the, the structure of sort of who, uh, who makes the cut, who get, how you get evaluated, how, how it gets pulled into your, uh, your overall, you know, performance and ranking as a, you know, one of the many highly qualified Marines or the most highly qualified Marine, um, you know, or the bottom of the Christmas tree. Um, and I think back to the Commandant's reading list, like it's it's a requirement every year, right? You're supposed to read, I think it's three titles from it and you're supposed to note it in your animal fitness report. But what happens if you don't do it? To my knowledge, nothing. Um, you could You could never read a book again in your Marine Corps career. And there's, you know, literally no detriment to you going forward and doing stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that something like, you know, the, uh, the, the wargaming list needs to be a critical part of that, but like, it needs to matter. If we want to institutionalize, it needs to be made to matter. Good performance in it in wargaming needs to be made to matter in a positive sense and failure to do it or failure to, you know, embrace the possible learning and decision-making habit pattern building stuff, training value to Marines failure to do all that stuff should also matter in, uh, in a detrimental sense. Um, so I, I guess we'll see on that point. I think I also have a strong sense of optimism for the Marine Corps and, and its path. Um, the reason I say this is because the weakness has always been uh, with this, this sort of boom and bust cycle with board gaming has always been the lack of inst institutional like structure uh, and, and processes that will make it keep going um and i think we are in the first 
you know I mean transition point where like people who were part of that first wave of that renaissance of the marine corps like ian being at the kulak center and so forth and passing it on to kiwi who's on this uh, podcast right? and the fact that tim is now like entrenched as the educational wargaming director at mcu and the establishment of the neller seller uh, center that is going to be like the wargaming hub and the fact that that staff is exploding right from like i think like maybe like 20 people to like anywhere close to 100 not all of them will be game designers but still that's like a massive expansion right um so i think all those signs are sort of ticked towards it right um my promise uh my my little ounce of pessimism is that i don't think we made enough um progress down at the echelons right down in the enlisted side down at the tactical you know company battalion level because all of, all the examples i just gave are like all national capital region quantico region right headquarters marine corps like big head shed uh progress right and now the question is how do we push it down to uh ews to the uh the c debt right like your know, non-resident schooling right how do we push it down that way and we're making i think great progress towards it um i i just worry like you know what I mean what happens if tim gets hit by lightning right like tim you know what i mean don't get hit by lightning but like you know what i mean like that's always my concern is like what happens with where, where our great champions um go away right whether they retire you're know, to hawaii and sip mojitos right uh and so forth and i think that is always my concern is like how do we build that pipeline to replace kiwi after you know what i mean you have to replace ian right and how do we keep getting these like um, right people at the right places to keep this momentum going um, beyond just like, oh, just trust the manpower system. And I was like, oh, that's like the worst decision ever. <laughs> right? um, so I think that's a part of it. And I think that sort of dovetails into what Ian said is like, if you want to produce the right people, you need to create the right incentives and reward the right behavior. Um, and that doesn't mean that everyone has to be a war gamer. But if you say, hey, like if you know how to war game, you contribute to war gaming at your echelon, like that's great. And we'll, that's a plus. It's never a minus, right? I think that's a part of it. Um, so that's my little uh, TED talk right now. I'll, I'll rant uh, off of that. Yeah, Mr. Berica just added in that it's up to 200 now uh, for the Neller Center. So e e even more. Yeah, even more. So yeah, you know what I mean. Apparently, they're just gonna hire like five classes of my of my students because that's I don't know how they're gonna uh, get two hundred more gamers. I'm sure there, I'm sure there's a bunch of gamers somewhere that will happily just play games for a living. Uh, so with that, I it was great to have both of you back on the podcast, uh, Ian. I'm sure it felt a little weird being on the opposite end of the microphone this time around, uh, but thank you both for your time uh, and your insight today. I think we could have probably talk for several more hours, at least between the three of us. Uh, so thank you to all the folks who also joined us today in the chat. That's all we have for this episode. So go ahead and carry out the plan of the day. Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Krulak community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you have enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.